I'm looking at my cat over here. I wish she would come here so I could have her on camera and cuddle with me. Anyway, hi, I'm Reese. Uh, welcome to Adventure With Me. And I'm so excited to talk about Bo Burnham's Inside. Uh, Bo Burnham is so self-aware that it hurts, which is why I wish my cat would come over here and cuddle me to comfort me through this. <laughs> As a whole, I really enjoyed his comedy special and I thought maybe I should do like a, a, a full review. Maybe I'll go like one by one or just do a couple. Let me know what you guys uh, think about this type of content. Usually I stream a video game and then do like a review after. So this is the first time I'm actually talking straight to the camera without streaming. So I'm a little spooked. Let's see how this goes and try it out. Hey kids, today we're going to learn about the world. The world that's around us is pretty amazing But how does it work? It must be complicated The secret is the world can only work When everything works together Okay, so when he says the secret is the world can only work when we work together I almost sang it, that was scary I find that line really interesting Because um, in international theory, one of the first things that you learn is that there's two major schools of thought, so liberalism and realism. <laughs> and realism asserts that people have to defend themselves from others with, like, think guns, bombs, rockets. Um, so violence helps us get along, pretty much. And then liberalism asserts that the world works because of interconnectivity, or liberalism, as Bo is saying, um, when everything works together. So interesting enough, like, in international relations space, uh, the majority of, like, prolific theorists believe that realism is how the world works, and we work together because we don't want imminent destruction. We work together because we're afraid of each other. Uh, so it's... I always found that interesting that aside from theory, people think that we all work together because we care about each other when a lot of people who write about this kind of stuff don't have that belief. I just think it's interesting. I wanted to point that out. Together, a bee drinks from a flower and leaves with its pollen. A squirrel in a tree spreads the seeds that have fallen. Everything works together. The biggest elephant, the Okay, I love that. That's so cute because I think it's really smart that Bo puts a bunch of examples in like biology or like uh, real life in nature where everything seemingly works together, you know, just seamlessly. But the thing that is so frustrating but beautiful about humanity is that, you know, we have the ability to think about philosophical concepts. Uh, and, you know, bees don't. Maybe this is how a biologist or, like, a beekeeper has this deep understanding about how the world works, but it's good to remember that this part of the song teaches us that we all see the world through our own little lenses. This type of theory or thought process is called constructivism. So, sure, we can talk about how the world works, but for everyone, the way they move through the world works a little bit differently. For example, if you have privilege, if you're a refugee, sure, maybe we're all living in America or Canada, wherever, but if you're a part of a nation where maybe you don't speak the native language, you know, it's your second language, you're going to move through that world differently. And maybe there is a set way in how the world works, but we experience it differently. So the way the world works to you because of your experience is going to be different uh, based off of like someone else's experience. It, that doesn't make either experience invalid. In trying to make the world a better place, um, just being able to communicate the different types of things that happen in people's lives um, and empathize with that is a huge part in like peacemaking that is how the world works that is how the world works from a to zebra to the worms in the dirt that's how it works 
Hey everyone, look who stopped by to say hello. It's Socko. Hey. Where you been, Socko? I've been where I always am when you're not wearing me on your hand. In a frightening liminal space between states of being. Not quite dead, not quite alive. It's similar to a constant state of sleep paralysis. All right, so when I noticed the first time watching it that this was a children's song, uh, it might be obvious to some people upon watching it for the first time, but to me it wasn't, okay? Uh, when he pulled out that sock puppet, I was like, oh, he's he's going deep here. So uh, when I thought when he used this medium to present these ideas, I thought like, hmm, why did he choose this type of medium? So the puppet talks about being in a frightening liminal space between states of being. Um, so there's two different ways that I can possibly interpret that, and that's just to me. I'm sure lots of different people have different opinions on what that could possibly mean. So one is kind of a parallel to how children are, like they regurgitate things that we tell them, and at first their existence, before they grow up and make their own decisions, is largely based around what everyone around them tells them to think. Sako can conversely be seen as like a mirror to Bo's persona. It's something that Bo is able to have when he needs it, take it off when he doesn't want it anymore. And maybe this is kind of a way to like look at himself, you know, using this outward being. Sako can be a part of Bo's personality that he can just take on and off whenever it's convenient. The simple narrative taught in every history class is demonstrably false and pedagogically classist. All right. <clears throat> the simple narrative taught in every history class is demonstrably false and pedagogically classist. Pedagogy is the practice of teaching. Um, so Sako is saying that we learn history through a classist lens. When I first heard this, like, class is a really interesting way to perceive history being taught to children, and I would attribute it more to as, like, a nationalistic lens. For example, the U.S. wants to write its history books taught using extreme nationalism. For example, the U.S. wants to write in its history books what makes the U.S. look good, as the U.S. wants to look good to its citizens or its children who it's raising up to hopefully be a good member of society to serve the United States at the end of the day. So things that they might teach children or things that were even taught to me as a kid, like Christopher Columbus came and we shared meals and Thanksgiving and got along and assimilation is a good thing because people take things from other cultures and we learn from each other and le live peacefully. Like it is an oversimplification of what actually happens. We grow up and we learn about the colonization and the violence. We learn that we didn't learn. We feel like cheapened out and not learned learning about that integral part of our history. And this isn't just a Western ideal or like something that just happens in the US. I say history is taught by a nationalistic lens because other countries do it too. For example, Japan, for example, what had happened with the comfort women. In all fairness, they have added that back into their um, curriculum, but a lot of the World War II war crimes um, are omitted. It's in other places such as the Tiananmen Square incident in China. Of course, they want to make their nations look good, so they omit whitewash things in their books to make themselves look better. So yeah, history is widely known to be written biased, like a lot of things, whether that be biased in the way of like looking through things through a classist lens or a nationalistic lens, uh, even though it's important to question the information that you learn in school, always, you know, want to just learn the truth. Um, it's not constructive to come at the like school system and be like, oh, well, our school has a certain agenda and you're teaching me things because you want to control me. Like just legitimately try and hear things out. Like your teachers aren't part of this larger conspiracy. Most of those people that want to help children like be the best versions of themselves. And even though it's fine to question the things that you learn, you shouldn't go out and like be combative and like attack people for just trying to do their best. I've just seen that happen a lot with people who go out and straight, like, challenge their teachers and just 
like head on like they're their enemy don't come at it um combative and then you'll learn the most from that like you'll learn the most from each other i guarantee you most of those teachers if you're all like oh well what about colonialism they'll be like totally like your teachers like high school teachers they probably have master's degrees and like went through this whole thing like they know and if you open that conversation it might be that is really fulfilling to them that they that they get to teach these things your teachers like they have a set curriculum of things that you need to learn so that you pass the test so that you can get to the next grade you know they're they're not trying to brainwash you like themselves you know it's part of this larger system that has a lot of systemic issues and problems and we should all just try our best to work together you know with that kind of stuff don't you know the world is built with blood and genocide and exploitation the global network of capital essentially functions to separate the worker from the means of production and the FBI kill- Okay, when I heard this too, so the global network of capital essentially functions to separate the worker from the means of production. So our comrade Sako, <laughs> this is definitely a Marxist critique. Um, it's important to remember that Marxism is a critique of capitalism and, and not a, a theory. So if you want to read the Communist Manifesto, it's a fun read. You should do that. I'll link it in the description. By the global network of capital. I haven't heard like the global economy be described as like a global network of capital, but I'm going to interpret that talking about the global division of labor because like that's how capital is made by that global division of labor. If you disagree with that, let me know in the comments because I'm really curious to see um, like how you guys interpret like the global network of capital. Before the global division of labor, we had like artisans who made stuff. Uh, for example, like you had a raw material to make a shirt. And then with that material that you had, you made the shirt and you sold the shirt and you got the money from the shirt. Or you bartered with it. You traded the shirt for some ham or whatever. <laughs> like, I don't know. And throughout history, we have learned to split up that labor for efficiency's sake. For example, raw materials are cultivated from one nation, and then those raw materials are produced in, an e in another nation, and then those goods are sold to another nation. So there's like a division of how goods are made and sourced and sold. So raw materials were usually taken by means of like colonial conquest, for example, like the US went to a country said, oh cool, that resource is ours now, so give us that gold, and then we'll ship the gold to China, and they'll use it to make microchips, and then we'll sell that to our Americans. You know, so that's how that global division of labor ended out working. Like, in theory, we separate the raw materials or the global south from the global north. So the global north has the finance and capacity to invest in higher quality or advanced manufactured goods, whereas the global south does not have the similar capacity to invest in that level of production. So because of this, like the global south or the group that provides the raw materials or even makes those products for the global north is stuck having to rely on exporting cheap goods and raw materials. But the problem is, is that these materials are losing value while manufactured materials in the global north are gaining value. So the global south has less and less bargaining chips or valuable items to purchase the global north's goods. And so they have to rely on borrowing money from the very people who have exploited them in the first place. That cycle of exploitation is something that is seen in like the global division of labor. So the way the global south or competition states are exploited are through SAPs or structural adjustment programs. So these are like floating exchange rate, financial deregulation, spending intervention. Like Sacco's point in talking about the global network of capital, or which I interpreted as the global division of labor, and saying that it has a huge part in separating the worker from the means of production, I mean, 
of course, like, it's a point, but it's not a super strong point. Um, the means of production are the physical or non-financial inputs used in the production of goods and services with economic value. So that includes raw materials, facilities, machinery, tools, like used in the production of goods. Global production of labor from the global north as consumers are very separated from the very laborers who are producing our goods or giving raw materials for those goods. Yes, that's going to be separated, but it's a, it, it's odd. It's an odd point to make. I'd probably rephrase Sacco's point as the global network of capital essentially functions to exploitate the workers through the means of production. That kind of gives a nod to the international division of labor or the global division of labor and making it a world problem instead of a national problem. Um, and that's something I think maybe Sako didn't think about. I don't know. I don't know if, if I try to sing that, if it would be just as catchy. No, 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 no. Let's see what else Sako has to say. The FBI killed Martin Luther King. Private property is inherently theft. And neoliberal fascists are destroying the left. And ah, private property is inherently theft and neoliberal fascists are destroying the left. Yes, this phrase rhymes, but we're gonna split it up into two. Private property being theft. The practice of a person or group owning land and distributing it can, it, it's argued that it's not new because for example, kings owned land, even though you didn't have to pay for it, but they gave that land to people who served the kingdom um, or protected the king, entertained the king or worked on the farms or stuff like that. Private property isn't isn't a thing for most people because most people don't own their house, they pay rent on that land. So that's what Sako's saying when it's inherently theft because someone just owns that land and says, if you want to stay there, pay me for it. And that can be seen as exploitative. And that's something that I would agree with too. It's pretty solid. I'd be really curious if you like disagreed with that. So let me know, let me know <laughs> in the comments. Moving on with that statement, because he says private property is inherently theft and neoliberal fascists are destroying the left. So neoliberal fascism, that's a doozy. Neoliberalism is critiqued that it's predatory. Predatory capitalism goal is to consolidate power into the hands of the financial elite, basically. So put simply, neoliberalism seeks to liberate the market from any restraints from the state. But neoliberal fascism, depending on how you define each word, neoliberal and fascist, it can be like an oxymoron because it can, they can be thought of as meaning very similar things. Um, it can be argued that neoliberalism is the new fascism because people use the means of money to exploit people instead of, you know, using the government or politics to exploit people. That's a huge, huge discussion. Both neoliberalism and fascism are seen as right-wing populist movements. So think, when you think right-wing populist movements, it can be described as like ultra-nationalism. Um, so believing that you're a part of a state, like to a fault, like being super duper American and standing behind the state before you stand behind like human rights, if that makes sense. Like you're way, way behind your state into ways that aren't helpful to society as a whole. And so xenophobia as being afraid of the other, for example, like if someone is not American, like you're like, oh, that makes you lesser than, that's xenophobia. Both neoliberalism and fascism um, further the us versus them mentality um, and cause a lot of division. If you are interested in reading further on neoliberalism, I'd recommend like starting with Keynesianism. That's like 1936 and then it makes this jump to like Hayek, is like the 1940s. So you can look up those two authors if you're interested in these concepts. So during the neoliberal revolution in like the 80s, so during the neoliberal revolution that happened in like the 80s, this is what gave 
uh, people such big critiques of neoliberalism. So first of all, the government stepped back in the aid of unions and its aid for its citizens. So since the end goal is just making money, making more money, um, it encouraged like women who were usually like in the 40s, just spent time at home to be a homemaker and take care of their children, but that was no longer a value. You had to make money to make value. So it led to like children, or it can be thought of um, children not being taken care of in the pursuit of money. And in the pursuit of money, we have like environmental issues because you gotta make the cheapest jeans, so let's acid wash them and throw the acid into the water because the end goal isn't, you know, taking care of the environment or taking care of people it's making more money so it can be seen as neoliberalism is this really harsh thought that doesn't value people or nations or especially those who can be considered the other but it only concerns making money so to say that neoliberal fascism is destroying the left i don't know why the Sacco would say that neoliberal fascism is destroying the left because neoliberal fascism would destroy all but the elite. So if you're going to say everyone but the left is elite, I would find that incorrect. So I think we can learn something from Sacco here. Sacco can teach us a really important lesson. Um, Sacco is using a bunch of jargon big words, big ideas that sound solid if you don't really know what the concepts behind like neoliberal fascism mean. His arguments are very non-specific and they don't have any really strong meaning on their own. Because um, as you can see, we were basically trying to guess what Sacco meant uh, throughout this song because he didn't have very strong hypothesis. But trying to understand Sacco, um, Sacco's kind of echoing the Marxist critique on capitalism and asserting that capitalism, after all, is exploitative, and I'd absolutely agree with that. And this statement, if you hear, like, neoliberalism is destroying the left and you're just all like, ah, yes, for sure, because I've, I've seen a lot of comments like that and then I'm just like, um, maybe you should question yourself because these are big, nuanced concepts that, you know require you to look at specific situations um, and evaluate those situations based on facts. And you might, you know, if, if you hear this and, and it speaks deeply to you, and I can be wrong and let me know, you could be agreeing with the buzzwords you hear and having a strong identity and identifying with the labels, like being against neoliberalism, being part of the left, and just identifying with those labels instead of correctly understanding the concepts um, behind those labels. So remember, if you hold too tight to your identity, that's just like a label in a, in a word, um, such as like being on the left or anti-neoliberal, it, it can hurt you in the end because if you're just listening to arguments and hearing things that you want to agree with, you, you might not end up hearing the truth. And after all, we all just want to be better critical thinkers and to know what's going on and to know the truth. So I really implore you to see like arguments from people who are from the opposing side of you and just because someone doesn't agree with you or you don't agree with them it doesn't make one person inherently better or worse than the other and i just aim to have constructive conversations instead of identifying so strongly with a label um and we'll have a more peaceful conversation that way and every politician every cop on the street protects the interests of the pedophilic corporate elite uh, I, so I, I like how he goes straight into that, like, jargony, jargony sentence, neoliberal fascists are destroying the left, and then says, every politician, every cop on the street, uh, protects the interests of the pedophilic corporate elite. So, 
Bo really brings it home that Sokko likes to generalize, and uh, this was more nuanced in the prior statement, like, uh, neoliberal fascists are destroying the left, and now he's like, every politician and cop uh, protects a pedophilic interest. Using generalizations of your statements um, can be really harmful and cause a divide and cause uh, misunderstandings. I really think when people overly generalize, they don't, they don't actually mean every politician and every cop uh, protects pedophilic interests. I, I don't think that that's the actual point. They're just saying that they're a part of a system that inherently consciously protects those evil interests, even though that person does not protect those interests. Rather than all cops or politicians are complicit um, in pedophilia, Isako, through this gross overgeneralization, is saying that they're complicit in a larger system that upholds evil things. And I think that's something that everyone struggles with. It's like, oh, Republicans don't care about people. All liberals want a utopia. It's again, an oversimplification of the things that each group wants. So even though Sokko's trying to get the point across that this is towards like unknowing participation in a complex system that is imperfect, he's kind of like being accusatory towards these groups instead of getting behind like, oh, this is a, uh, this system that you're a part of is corrupted because of blank. And I think like if you talk to a cop, if you talk to a politician, they're not going to say, some aren't going to say, oh, that's not true. Like, of course, like that's why those people are in those professions to try and make it so that they can make a better world. And of course that there are people who are part of that system because they want to uphold those evil things. But I, honestly believe that most aren't and to come at those people who hold those professions with an accusatory tone is not helpful to anyone um so Sako teaches us again that we should not be accusatory towards people and throw around jargon when not meaning to i think Sako is critiquing people's individual moral and character when i don't think that that's Sako's point or the overall point but for lack of the understanding of these concepts that Sako is talking about. He's just going to accuse the other side because it's difficult for some people to think of arguments that are deeper than that. And I think that's what Sako is doing right now. And I think that's what Bo is trying to get out right now as well. So, all right, let's listen to more of this beautiful, beautiful song. It's how the world works. Really? That is how the world works. Genocide, the natives say you got to it first. That's how. Ah. Yeah, I mean, that that happens. If you're curious about this phenomena, it's usually called uh, colonialism. Uh, when one country decides, ooh, yeah, I want that thing, uh, that's, the, your land is, is my land now. And then takes it by violent means. But genocide can also happen um, within nations. Uh, so, such as, like, the Uyghur genocide in China. Um, it also happened in Rwanda in the 90s. Genocide doesn't have to be of native people in order to be considered genocide. And I'm just throwing out some ideas like if you are interested in researching those things, um, those are good places to start. I do it first. That's how it works. That's pretty intense. No shit. What can I do to help? Read a book or something, I don't know. Just don't burden me with the responsibility of educating you. It's incredibly exhausting. I'm sorry, Sako. I was just trying to become a better person. Why do you rich fucking white people insist on seeing every socio-political conflict through the myopic lens of your own self-actualization? This isn't about you. So either get with it or get out of the fucking way. Watch your mouth, buddy. <laughs> Remember who's on whose hand here. But that's what I- have you not been fucking listening? We are in- All right, All right so, um, this is an example of, you know, bad communication on both Sako and Bo's character's parts. Uh, Bo is defensive and Sako is being accusatory. And you're not gonna have a genuine or 
proactive like conversation if that's how you're going to speak to each other so it's a good example on how not to talk to people um <laughs> so let's go into some examples um from Sako's lines so Sako says uh, every white person, why does every white person have to see sociopolitical conflict through the myopic lens of your own self-actualization? So the myopic lens is basically Sako calling Bo narrow-minded. If you see things through a myopic lens, you're seeing things through uh, one of you and you're not being a very good constructivist. So self-actualization is the journey that every human being goes through. Um, and this can be seen by Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I, I'll, I'll put it, I'll put it over here. <laughs> um, so Sako is basically saying, why do white people use the struggles of others uh, to fulfill their own needs um, in just talking about these issues because you want to feel better about yourself? Now, even though that's a very good point that Sako is making, uh, he says it very accusatory and in a way that makes Bo shut down, but the way that Bo reacts isn't healthy either. But Sako is basically saying, oh, you get to sit here, you get to have your existential crisis, you get to have your pity party, while I am the one living this horrible pain, this horrible reality that you only have trouble hearing about. Like... And you get to say, oh, that's how the world works. That's so sad. That makes me sad. Well, it's just a regular day for the other person. Sako is upset with Bo, and righteously so, because, like, Bo has the privilege to just see these things and be like, oh, mm, oh, well, that's so sad. How can I make the world a better place? And uh, that's off-putting. he be seen as Bo making the problem about himself. Like his own self-actualization, he's trying to use his experience to make him seem like he's learning something, to make him feel like he's being a better person. That's infuriating to people. The privilege to make these sufferings about themselves it's gross just throwing a personal example out there that uh, other people might be able to like understand i had like a diversity training the diversity training was given by a black woman and she was saying that every day she has to struggle with people talking to her and not seeing her even as a human being first or as a woman first but seeing her blackness first and how that hurt her in everyday life. And then there was a white woman who like leaned over to me. She was like, oh, this is, this is so much. This is so hard for me. Like, I think I, I have to go like, and like take a break. Even though that can be a lot for someone because they can feel like they can see in those diversity trainings, like they treat other people like that. Like they touch people's hair without their consent. They see someone's blackness and make preconceived notions and bring up like stereotypes about really stupid stuff before seeing them as a person and and they see that and it hurts them and instead of being like oh dang i i should i do that i do that and i should be better they see that and they're like oh this is too much for me like i don't want to have to see this and it just stops anything from getting solved. So, how can this interaction have been improved? I'd say that Sako using his jargon is absolutely stopping Sako from having a more productive conversation with Bo. Um, as you can see, this whole video was like breaking down the concepts that Sako had. Uh, they have a lot of different meanings behind what he could have possibly been trying to say the jargon as they were sometimes it can even seem a little bit nonsensical part of Sako trying to combat that power imbalance Sako's using a bunch of jargon to try and come in with the upper hand on top of Bo already being like not only do I have my experience but now I have this academic knowledge that you don't have and like you better not challenge that and listen to me and then Bo's like oh I'm just trying to be a better person like don't challenge that and listen to me. And so we have this combative atmosphere. Um, and I think if everyone just lets their egos down a lot, uh, we'll have a more productive conversation. Um, and a lot of that responsibility has to come on the person who has the power, who should have more of the responsibility to really understand where that defensiveness is coming from and, 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 and try and listen better. I, I really would implore you to do that. And you need to look at yourself and think, oh, 
I have racist tendencies, like, I'm xenophobic, like, you need to realize that into yourself, and you need to change it, because you are not perfect, okay, so, guys, you, you gotta start really looking at yourself and changing, and when people come forward, and they're all like, oh, I do have these racist thoughts, these racist tendencies, these xenophobia, like, then, hold people accountable for trying to change that and then also don't demonize them as soon as they're vulnerable with you and say that these are these issues don't point in their face and be like ha i knew it like all right i'm really glad you see that now i'm gonna hold you accountable um for the things that you say you know so uh, it's teamwork teamwork here see what happens here see what happens here wait wait no please i don't want to go back <laughs> Are you going to behave yourself? Hey, look at me. Yes. So uncomfortable. <laughs> That's better. I hope you learned your lesson. I did and it hurt. That's how it worked. Yeah. So as we can see, Bo is taking advantage of his position of power. Uh, after feeling threatened by what Sokka had to say, even though Sokka was able to say everything he wanted and he wasn't necessarily silenced or he wasn't even afraid to speak up in the first place, but after he said what he had to say, he was beat down and silenced for daring to assert that Bo take responsibility for his personal downfall. We see in the end that Bo is being like, okay, stay in your lane we can look at reality sure you could say everything you want but when i'm uncomfortable the conversation ends and that's something that's very very harmful and you should not be that kind of person <laughs> um this can be seen as an example as virtue signaling uh, when you're putting forward like a facade about caring about an issue when you're doing it just to make you look good but the complicated thing about this situation i think a lot of situations um, is that it's not the intention of Bo's character to virtue signal, but it's what's happening. And Sako calls Bo out on that, and that's what ticks Bo off. And Sako says, you know, you now, you know, what ticked him off in the first place is saying that white people see sociopolitical conflict through the myopic lens of their own self-actualization, and he reacted so strongly because that's true and then shut down the conversation instead of being like, oh, you're right, I'm gonna be better. You know, Sako is right, you're disagreeing with me and letting me speak to make yourself feel good. Um, and in the end, the very platform to give Sako the ability to talk was the person in power, just allowing him to speak the truth because it also makes Bo feel and look good. And at the end of the conversation, we just get... <laughs> that it's just over because he has the power to end the conversation and we don't get anything more because that's how the world works <laughs> i am so down to have a conversation in the comments uh this was a lot of fun just talking straight to the camera um let me know if you want me to look up any different songs next different series uh even from inside and uh, maybe next time my cat will join us that would be very funky fresh okay love you bye mm -hmm.